Praise be Jesus Christ. I'd like to start this lesson off with a, um, a prayer um, from page 23 of the Oratory, uh, Place of Prayer, Prayer Book. And this is the Act of Faith. Um, go ahead and pray this to start. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh my God, I firmly believe that you are one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that your divine Son became man and died for our sins and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because you have revealed them. In this faith, I desire to live and die. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to go ahead and start off with uh, the Gospel. Uh, there, are, there are three Gospels for the transfiguration of our Lord. But I would like to go ahead and start off with... Um, with the reading from Matthew's Gospel. This is Matthew 17, 1 through 9. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with them. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. <clears throat> But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, <clears throat> excuse me, Do not tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to go ahead and just do a, a few reflections here. Um, there's so many different ways, uh, so many things we can learn from the Transfiguration. The focus, though, that I want to connect is, um, is, a, is a reflection that a priest had given me once about how the Transfiguration ties into the Divine Liturgy, the Mass. So at first, just want to go ahead and put the characters that are in this, in this story. We have Jesus, we have Peter, James, and John, Moses, and Elijah. Those are the characters that are in this gospel. If we look at the, the Mass, um, which is um, the central the source and summit of our faith, this, uh, this beautiful Mass that our Lord Himself has given to us. We look at the Mass, we can see the Mass is, is broken up into two parts, uh, which we're, we're most, mostly familiar with. The Liturgy of the Word, and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. We look at this a little bit more, we know that um, as part of the Liturgy of the Word, although there's a lot of different parts, um, we think of what it is that we're hearing during this Word. In other words, how is the Word of God being uh, preached to us? We hear first a reading from the Old Testament, and then we respond with a psalm, that's uh, chanted or sung. And then uh, after the Old Testament reading, we have usually an epistle. And then, of course, we never have a Mass without the Gospel. And in this Gospel, uh, we, we shift our posture even to show the importance of this Gospel. Um, for, for the other readings, we're, we're seated and our bodies are expressing that, that we're receptive, of course, to this, this listening of the Word of God, the Old Testament, and then the Epistle, and then our response through the Response Royal Psalm. And then, and then we always uh, stand, everyone stands, and if we are not in the Lenten season, then we'll say Alleluia there, and if we are, then we have a, a Gospel acclamation. Um, something like, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of Endless Glory. But before this, we stand and we greet um, in a sense, we, we greet our Lord who is coming to us in the gospel, and, and, and we, uh, we acclaim joy, great joy at this. 
So if we were to connect these figures, Jesus, Peter, James, John, Moses, and Elijah, and we were to try to connect these characters with these three parts, of course we would put Moses and Elijah in the Old Testament. These are um, some of the major figures of the Old Testament. We have Moses, who is uh, the one that is given the law and then gives that law to the people, uh, who courageously leads the people out of slavery of Pharaoh into um, or to the point of the promised land, right? And then Elijah, the great prophet. So we have the law and the prophets um, that are here. In the epistles, we have Peter, James, and John, who all wrote letters. These are central figures to the early church. Peter, of course, being our first Holy Father, the Pope, and, and James and John, um, these three apostles central to, uh, to the apostolic succession and the passing on of the truths of Jesus Christ and, and the, uh, the early apostles. So, and then, of course, we have Jesus, who is the gospel. It, it is, he is the good news. This is his life that we meditate, that we stand with great joy of claim and greet um, Jesus Christ. All of this right here is what we have at every single Mass. Um, whether we are at a daily Mass or whether we are at a, a Sunday Mass, we, every Mass, no matter what, have an Old Testament, uh, an Epistle, and a Gospel. Um, I'm sorry, at the, at the daily Masses we just have one reading, but at the Sunday Masses we always have an Old Testament, a New Testament, and then the Gospel. And this is important because what we see at the Transfiguration is we see these same characters present. We see Moses and Elijah. And the importance of this is that, that Jesus um, has witnesses. Okay, It's important that any time you're going to present a truth, there needs to be someone that can be a witness to this. If you're in the court of law and, and you're uh, trying to present a truth, maybe you're trying to have an alibi saying, well, I wasn't present at the murder scene. Well, you're going to be asked to call in witnesses. And the more witnesses, um, the better, and, and especially if the witnesses are credible. Well, what we see at the Transfiguration is that we do have the witness of the Old Testament. The Old Testament heroes, Moses and Elijah, are, are flanking the sides of Jesus Christ, who is transfigured, and affirming, witnessing that He indeed is the Son of God, um, that he, he is indeed the truth that He says that He is. We also have the presence of, of the apostles, the, um, this, this apostolic core, these central friends of Jesus Christ who will be responsible for continuing his mission, his saving mission, and will be given the task of evangelizing to the four corners of the world. So we have Peter, James, and John who are also there to witness this event. And they are told at the end by Jesus that once he dies and rises, that they will be responsible to share this story. So we have the Old Testament heroes witnessing, and we also have the New Testament apostles who will be the evangelizers and go out to the whole world witnessing this event. And then Jesus Christ himself, who when he does uh, stand transfigured, we also hear the voice of the Father. Just as we had heard the voice of the Father at the baptism of the Lord, we now again hear the voice of the Father. And this is what we experience at every Mass, this witness to the truth. From the Old Testament, that continuation, to the New Testament, the early church, the apostolic church, and then of course Jesus Christ himself, the truths contained in the Gospel. And just as Peter James, Peter exclaimed, it is good that we are here. This should also be what we exclaim when we get to go to Mass. When we have that great privilege of being at Mass, what is it that, that we are beholding when we go to Mass? We are beholding the witness of the Old Testament. We are beholding the witness of the Apostles. And we are beholding the truth of Jesus Christ Himself. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas says, Truth itself speaks truly. Jesus Christ, the truth. Truth itself speaks truly, or there is nothing that is true. Every time we go to Mass, we are just being, the truth is being poured, 
poured out to us through these readings. And that truth is attested to or witnessed to by the Old Testament, the, continu the, the continuation of the Old Testament, the apostles, and Jesus Christ. Um, and we can indeed say with the apostle Peter, we can say it is good that we are here. It is good that we are here. And I want to stress that we. Um, I personally feel, feel very proud when I'm at Mass during the Liturgy of the Word. I feel very connected to everyone that's there. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, whether it's a church that has a thousand people or whether it's a church that has 50 people, there's a connection that when you see everyone listening to the same words, um, when everyone responds with the Psalms, and if they're done correctly, everyone responds from their heart, when everyone stands together um, at the at attention, you know when when you uh, maybe see the priest bless the deacon or, or, or when the when they start to process to the ambo so that they can preach the word of God and everyone exclaims Alleluia or praise to you Lord Jesus Christ that feeling that we are indeed together here that we are doing this together that we are standing at attention together that we are being receptive um, it's very power in the Eastern liturgies when um, before the gospel there's actually a procession out into the nave of the church and then it goes back into the sanctuary and, and the words are uh, be attentive, wisdom, be attentive, right? That the people are going to be attentive. Um, this idea that we are in this together, we are listening together, we are acclaiming all of these things together and it is good that we are here. It is good that we are mass. Same thing that they felt at the transfiguration. As we move into the next part, we first want to go back to the transfiguration and, and see what happens. After Peter says, um, then Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. And then a little bit, loud, a little bit later, uh, when he is still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. And from the cloud came a voice, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, when they heard the voice of God, they fell, right? They fell prostrate, and they were much afraid. This awe had come over them, much afraid, and they just bowed down, okay? Um, no longer looking at Moses, no longer looking at Elijah, no longer even looking at the Lord or each other. They just bowed down of this overwhelming feeling, overwhelming experience that, they have, that they're having, they, just have, they can do nothing but just bow down in, in awe and reverence and fear, right? And then it's Jesus that touches them. Jesus actually touches them and says, Rise, do not be afraid. And this is the important part. When the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. So as they move into this section, what happens is, there's this moment where they're all experiencing this together. They're seeing everything. They're aware of everything. They're bringing everything in. They're overwhelmed by this amazing experience. They prostrate themselves. And then as they bring up, as they, as they rise and they lift up their eyes, they see no one else but Jesus alone. And isn't that what we experience at the Mass? After we have heard maybe a, a great homily and we have, we have uh, you know, worshipped together and, and exclaimed all these beautiful truths and listened to this great wisdom, and, and we feel that um, that is very great that we are here. That maybe our life is being challenged, that we're listening to the words of our Lord and being challenged by His teachings and being uh, given that, that, uh, that, that courage to go out and really live um, the way that Christ asks us to live. And, and sometimes then we, we kind of have this major shift in our liturgy that we move into the liturgy of the Eucharist that's a little bit more solemn, um, that asks us to kneel at certain times. And there actually are times, even though there might be a thousand people in the church, there are times where in the liturgy of the Eucharist, as we kneel and maybe even hunch over a little bit or prostrate ourselves as much as we can, there are times, especially during the Eucharistic prayer, that we can be so... Um, intent and in prayer that when we look up when we arise and our eyes look up all we see is Jesus alone this is a beautiful you know if you see the priest as they hunch over a little bit down in adoration and then they look up raising their eyes and all they can 
All they can see really then is the Eucharist. They see the Eucharist. They see Jesus Christ alone, no one else, okay? At this time, that's all that's there. That's all that's important. Just in the transfiguration, Moses and Elijah go away. They don't pay attention to each other. They just see Jesus. Their eyes are fixed on Jesus. In the same way this happens at the Mass, when we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Um, I want to um, just kind of talk a little bit. What, well, first, before we go into that, um, there's another phrase that really stands out, and that is, the phrase of God that says, listen to him. And this is different than, uh, there are two times that, that this, this kind of happens where we hear the voice of God. At the, remember at the baptism of the Lord, um, the voice of God is heard and it says, this is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased. And then it ends there. This is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased. In this reading, we hear a little uh, more this is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And that's exactly what we're doing when we adore Jesus in the Eucharist. After the Eucharistic prayer, or during the Eucharistic prayer, when, when the host is elevated, what are we doing there? We're listening to Jesus. We're adoring him, and we're listening to him in the silence of our heart, in the silence of that church. And whereas before we may have been recognizing everyone else and felt everyone else's presence, and felt the presence, of course, of the Word of God. And then at this moment, it, sometimes it's just as if it's Jesus and us. Same thing's true as we go up to communion, and, and, we, um, and we see that host, um, and we receive our Lord in the Eucharist. There is no one else. It's Jesus alone. Jesus alone, no one else. And that's what we focus on. So why is it that these words, listen to Him, are said at the Transfiguration, but that we don't hear these during the baptism? It's going to be very important for the disciples to listen to Jesus, to listen to him, even if they don't understand. So too, that's how it is with us. We need to listen to our Lord, even when we don't understand. We need to listen and to obey. He will reveal to us what we need to know and when we need to know it. It's really important because what's going to happen after this event, this is Matthew 17, after this event, they're going to Calvary. They're going to Jerusalem. Okay, They will be going and, and Jesus will say, I will die. Okay, and, and this is going to be hard for them. They're going to have to listen to him. They're, as they get, grow closer and closer to Calvary, they're going to have to listen and trust and obey. Same thing's true of us. When we see our Lord in the Eucharist, um, God is saying to us, the Father is saying to us, listen to Him. Because right now you see Him in His glory. You see Him now in the Eucharist. Listen to Him. Because when you go out of this church, when you go to your Calvaries, when you go to your times of suffering, and you encounter the sufferings of others, and the suffering of a sinful world, we will need to listen. We will need to obey, and we will need to trust. There's a beautiful tradition in our church. We look at here, this is the Mass. But there's um, a beautiful tradition in our church called Eucharistic Adoration. And one of the best explanations of adoration that I've ever heard is that um, the Mass, if you can think of it as kind of an hour or hour and a half, it's a film, right? It's going on, it's like a movie. And, and um, during that time, when the, when the priest elevates the host, um, and, and you'd almost just wish there could be more time there. Uh, maybe the, the elevation is for 20 seconds, or 10 seconds, or 30 seconds. But, but sometimes you just wish, oh, if there could just be a little bit more. If I could see you, Jesus, and gaze upon you, and listen to you, if I could just have a little bit more time to look at you, I would love that. And that's what we have in the church. So you think of the Mass going on, the Mass doesn't stop, it continues. It's this one beautiful fluid move, move, movement. And what we have um, in adoration is that this moment of the elevation of the host, Jesus Christ, it's paused for us. It's as if the Mass is just on, on, on pause for a second, 
and we get to maybe for an hour, maybe if we make a holy hour, or if we have adoration 24-7. What has happened is the church, in its great grace, has given us this moment of Eucharistic adoration, where it flows from the Mass. It's very important to understand that, that uh, adoration flows from the liturgy, and, and also helps lead us back to the liturgy. There is, I don't think there's anyone that can be in front of our, our Lord at this paused moment in adoration, this elevation. You know, Jesus is elevated in the monstrance. I don't think anyone can sit and gaze before our Lord and pray and not yearn to receive Him, not yearn to receive Him at the Mass. We can't receive Him into our body in adoration. Uh, we gaze upon Him physically and feel that spiritual presence and also His physical presence, but we are not able to receive Him into our body except at Mass. And so, with all of this, we have this beautiful tradition of, um, of adoration. I want to go ahead and just erase this for now and share with you four, four things that can help us really grow closer to our Lord and to His church. Uh, we have, of course, the Mass, which we just explained. Um, and I, wanted, I do want to say something about the two parts and then, and then kind of what happens at the end. Because we talked about the first part where we say it is good that we are here. It's good that we have to be receiving all this. And then the second part when Jesus is just alone. Just Jesus and us, the Eucharist, right? Um, that time of communion where we are as close to Him as we will ever be and we are close to others as we will ever be. Um, and then we have at the end what we have what's called the et misa es. Okay, and this is the Latin. Uh, the English translation is go forth. The Mass is ended. So that's the translation. Et misa es. This is where we get the word Mass. The word Mass means go forth, right? You're, go forth, the Mass is ended. So, so we are actually being dismissed. And it's this phrase, the et misa es, where, where we actually get our word Mass. So when Peter says, it's so good that we're here, and he wants to uh, pitch some tents, he asks, he offers to Jesus, can I please make three tents? One for Elijah, one for you, and one for Moses. And, and that's not the intention. The intention is not to stay up on the mountain. The intention is to go back down the mountain. I, I, actually, what will happen after is they will be going to Calvary. And they will have to take this experience. And the church says that it's this experience, this, um, this spiritual high, this transfiguration, this moment of glory, that is actually going to be able to get them through the, the, the scandal of the crucifixion. Uh, many times in life, we have to have these moments of highs to get us through the lows. You know, you think of a relationship, um, maybe it's a, it's a friend that you have, and you have some great moments, just some wonderful moments, some highs, some transfiguration type moments. And then those are going to get you through the low times. If you think of a marriage, uh, maybe a, a couple will um, look back at some of the great times and say, you know what, we can have that again, we can return to that. Or I know everything is okay because I know we clicked in those moments. Um, I remember when I played basketball in high school, um, I remember that I would always be willing to endure the tough exercises at the beginning of practice because we would always get to scrimmage at the end of practice. Uh, the same thing was true when I played rugby. All the, all the running drills that we'd have to have at the beginning of practice was completely fine because I knew we would get to, play, we would get to scrimmage. Um, I remember one time my basketball coach, we were doing a drill that I thought was a ridiculous and he was, asking, he was having us uh, dive after uh, a basketball. He would roll a ball, and, and then two people would compete, and they'd have to see who could, who could dive after the ball first. And usually we'd hurt ourselves as we were diving for the ball. And I remember I just didn't dive at all. And he got really mad at me because the, my opponent dove after the ball, and I just stayed standing. And he was, he was extremely mad at me, and, and this was disrespectful. I should have been a part of that activity but I just chose not to. And he said, why are you even here? Why don't you just go home? And I said, well, I don't want to go home because I know we're going to scrimmage later. And I think sometimes it's those high points, whether we anticipate them coming or we have experienced them in the past, it's those high points that will get us through. And this is definitely true of the transfiguration. Um, this experience for Peter, James, and John 
is going to help them be the apostles that they need to be. This is also true of us um, when we have these great experiences with our Lord. But we can't stay at that high. We can't stay on that mountain. We are sent to go down the mountain. We are sent to go out into some difficult situations. But we have to remember that it's the power of the Mass. Um, it's the experience of the Mass, the graces and mercy that we receive from the Mass that are enabling us to go out into the world. I want to go ahead and just share, we've already talked about Mass, and we've already talked about um, adoration. I want to talk about two other um, devotions, I guess, or, or even liturgies of our, of our church. We have Liturgy of the Hours, And Liturgy of the Hours, as we talked about, adoration is being kind of that, that paused moment of the Eucharist. When we see the, the Liturgy of the Word, we see that the Liturgy of the Hours is full of Scripture. It's full of the Word. It's full of New Testament uh, writings and Old Testament writings, especially the Psalms. So we get to continue on this beautiful, um, this beautiful practice of meditating on the Word and then adoring the Word made flesh. So I hope you can see that in Mass we get the Word, but also we get the Word made flesh. We have the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. In adoration, we get to continue the adoration of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, in, in His Eucharistic presence. And in the Liturgy of the Hours, we get to continue, continue our discussion, um, that conversation with God in His Word. I want to share another uh, devotion that is kind of uh, coming back. And uh, Pope Benedict actually said, Pope Emeritus Benedict actually said that if we were to do this ancient tradition correctly, we would have a new springtime in our church. And this is called Lexio Divina. This just means divine reading. With Lexio Divina, there's, there's uh, four main parts. There's the part where we just read. There's the part where we meditate. There's the part where we pray and then contemplate. And this practice uh, really has been practiced since the time of St. Benedict. Um, so, but it's been, been you know, different times in the church, very important, especially to the monastic life. And when you read, you just simply read. You're just reading the words. You're looking intently at the words. You're being attentive um, to the Word of God, whether it be the Gospel or some other reading. Um, and then when you meditate, all you're doing is using what they would say. You're just using your reason. You're using your mind to think. Why um, is this phrase interesting? Why is this word interesting? So in the reading part, you're just going to simply read, and then you're going to pick out a word or a phrase and just ask a bunch of questions, just using your intellect, just using your reason. Now, we know as Catholics we have both faith and reason. So we really, in the next part, the prayer, that's where our faith kicks in. It's our response. As we read anything in Scripture, as we ponder the Word of God in sacred Scripture, we want to use our reason. We want to meditate, and we want to say, what does this mean? What are you saying to me, God? What are all the different angles in which I can look at this? How does this apply to my life? And then we should be, there should be an urge, really, that comes from our heart. And a sense of the, the meditate comes from our mind, but then really the prayer comes from our heart. And that's our response back to what God has given us through this meditation. So we meditate using our reason, all right, and then that kind of flows, and we allow that to come back, and we respond in faith through our prayers. Um, how, how is this moving me? How, how, what is my response back to you, God, because of this? And then there's this part, really, called contemplation, which would really be to just be at peace and to be in the presence of God. This is really the, um, I guess, the overall, um, I guess if you want to say, the deep meaning that comes from the conversation. It's like when you have a good conversation, you meditate, you respond back. Sometimes when you have a conversation, 
you may have to return back to it in two days. Um, you have a deep conversation with someone. Maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a teacher, maybe in a classroom setting. And, and you have this conversation and you don't quite get it. But then later on you return back to it. And you're like, ah, now I understand what they were saying. Now I truly understand. You just have this moment where it all makes sense. And that's definitely true of Lexio Divina. This doesn't always come at once. That contemplation is really a grace, a gift from God. And so what I want to explain with this is, is really that in all of these things, Mass, Adoration, Liturgy of the Hours, and Lexio Divina, we see that, that our feelings are not primary. In Lexio Divina, for instance, it's not about feeling it. The feelings may or may not occur. The contemplation is usually that moment of that aha moment or that feeling part where you feel the closeness. You have almost a taste of God, right? That contemplation, that sweetness. Um, but that isn't going to necessarily happen in the practice of Lexio Divina. What is guaranteed to happen? Looking, reasoning, and faith. You could say that this is more of the feeling. Not necessarily a uh, physical feeling, but a spiritual feeling. A moment of connection, a tasting of God, the presence of God, and experiencing. But in Lexio Divina, what we see more that would happen would be faith, not necessarily feelings. Same thing's true of the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, there might be those moments of feelings, but for the most part, you're reading, you're meditating, you're allowing God to speak to you. Once again, it's an act of faith, it's a response to God. Um, mass and adoration. We may go to make a holy hour, and we may not feel anything. But definitely our action of going to adoration is an action of faith. It's a moment of faith in which we say, and it really is an act of faith, as we prayed earlier, that I say, Jesus Christ, I know you are there. I believe, help my unbelief. I have faith that you will direct my life. I have faith that you will give me the grace necessary to do what it is that you're asking me to do. And in adoration, although we may not have the feeling, we will have that faith. That faith that we can go in there and that that is Jesus and that he does speak to us. The same thing is true of Mass. Mass is full of faith. Mass is full of the teachings of Christ, um, the beliefs that we have. It's packed full of theology. If you look at all the scripture, if you look at all the meaning between the of the Mass. And so once again, we may not feel something at Mass. We may not have this amazing feeling, but we will always have faith. Um, it's important to make this statement because although the Transfiguration is a great moment of, I guess you could say, a spiritual feeling, maybe even a physical feeling, this is a, a moment of, of great feeling. But this isn't always happening in the Gospel. There's not always these moments of, of feelings, but there are tons and tons of moments of faith. So we have to ask ourselves, in, in not only our own uh, relationship with Christ, but also as we enter into the Mass, Adoration, Liturgy of the Hours, Lexio Divina, you know, uh, popular devotions, all of those things, what is more important to us? Is it our faith or is it our feelings? What's, what's the motivation? Is it faith or feelings? And a good analogy would be if you, if you take a train, what's going to be the engine of our spiritual life? Is the engine going to be faith? And it's our faith that is driving this train? And that feelings are just kind of a cart? In other words, if we take off that cart of feelings, do we still have the engine that runs, that faith? The other way to look at it is if we have feelings as the engine, and faith just happens to be behind that, subordinate to that, what happens when the feelings aren't there? It's definitely true that we can have faith without feelings. Um, but if we're just relying on feelings the whole time, um, and, and our faith is dependent on our feelings, then our faith is going to be weak. Our faith will be weak. God knows, and, and we see that in this gospel, God is a gracious, loving, and merciful God, and He will give us the feelings, the affirmation, the witness that we need. So God will give us those feelings when we need those feelings.
and if we need those feelings, and if he wills it. But the faith is a constant. The faith is a constant. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.